The following program was produced by the Theosophical Society in America. As you all know, mass culture today is filled with all sorts of irreverent jibes at religion. Over the summer, I remember seeing a TV commercial for a film called Hamlet 2, which displayed someone dressed up like Jesus saying, when my father finds out what I've done, he's going to crucify me. <laughs> now, you may find this in rather questionable taste, and I wouldn't entirely disagree but rather moral than moralizing about contemporary values, I think it'd be better to ask what this phenomenon is telling us. Whether you regard it as a good thing or a bad thing, I think you would have to agree that there's a great deal more irreverence in contemporary culture than there was a generation or two ago. Jibes and lampoons aimed at religion were, until comparatively recently, reserved for small coteries of free thinkers and unbelievers, but now they found a mass audience. A joke of the sort that I just mentioned would have been unthinkable on television even two or three decades ago. What has changed? To talk about the decline of organized religion in an institutional sense is interesting, but not all that interesting. And in any case, a large number of sociologists and cultural critics have dealt with it. If we're attempting to view things esoterically, we ought to expect to go a bit deeper. As you all know, there's a phenomenon called the procession of the equinoxes, which every 2,100 years or so inaugurates a new astrological age for humanity. When one age begins and another ends is never entirely clear because there's no dotted line up in the sky to um, distinguish between constellations. So there's an enormous amount of uh, argument and the uh, projected dates span centuries. Um, but it is sometimes said that a mark of the turning from one age to another is that the old gods are mocked and reviled. Clearly, this happened in Greco-Roman antiquity. An early manifestation was the satyr plays of the classical Athenian stage. If uh, you remember from your studies of Greek history, the history of drama, the Greek tragedies would have a trilogy. There would be three tragedies which were sad plays. And then it would be followed by a fourth, a comic satyr play, uh, which the gods would be made fun of. I think only one of these actually survives, which is the Cyclops of Euripides. I, don't quote me on that, but I think that's right. Um, so that is one example of the mocking of the gods. A later one was the satires of Lucian in the second century AD, where he has these witty and uh, dialogues between Zeus and Hermes, and uh, they're not really all that respectful. Even Plato, who is not exactly a scoffer, wanted to censor some of the more rollicking stories of the Olympian gods for the benefit of his ideal state. Now, in the early centuries of the Common Era, the new upstart religion of Christianity seized onto this trend and did its best to deride and discredit the pagan gods that had been worshipped for time immemorial. As we know, Christianity won the day. We could speculate that the decline of the old gods was more or less commensurate with the coming of the age of Pisces, astrologically. Pisces, of course, is the sign of the fish, or fishes, to be precise. And it is well known that the fish was an early symbol of Christ. Moreover, astrologers frequently connect Pisces with religion. And it may be no co coincidence that all the great world religions as we know them came into existence between 600 BC and 600 
50 AD, what is sometimes called the Axial Age. Even older religions, such as Judaism and Hinduism, were transformed during this period almost beyond recognition. The question that faces us today is this. Is Christianity a creation of the age of Pisces, which is, according to most astrologers, giving way to the age of Aquarius? And is this mocking of the old gods a sign of this passing? One piece of evidence in favor of this view is the joke that I started this talk with. The fact that such jokes are possible at all indicates that certain sacred images are losing their power. They no longer evoke the almost instantaneous awe, or if you prefer, dread, that they once did for a large sector of the population. An astrological age begins with divine revelation. It ends with a revelation of another kind, of the sort described in the Hermetic text known as the Asclepius. And I'll quote, even as the master and father, or to call him by his highest name, even as God is the maker of the gods of heaven, so man is the fashioner of the gods who dwell in temples and are content to have man for their neighbors. Thus man not only receives the light of divine life, but gives it also. He not only makes his way upward to God, but fashions gods. That is to say, that's the end of the quote, that is to say, there are certain eternal and unchanging truths and certain and eternal and unchanging forces, but the forms through which these truths are expressed come from man ultimately and are made by him. This was true of the gods of the Egyptians and the Canaanites, derided first by the Israelites and then by the Christians, but it may also be true of the gods of the latter as well. This does not mean that the forces to which these images point are false or have lost their power. But in some mysterious way that we do not understand, at certain points in history, these forces abandon the old forms and generate new ones, or rather call upon the human spirit to generate these forms. Today we find ourselves asking, are the eternal truths of the secret doctrine of the esoteric teaching which are universal and transcend any one particular form, still expressed in Christianity in a living and vital way. What, for that matter, is esoteric Christianity? Well, I would imagine and hope that the speakers that we've assembled for this weekend will offer their own perspectives on these issues, which no doubt will differ from mine. But since I'm the one uh, at the podium at the moment, uh, I might as well offer my own. To begin with, a reminder about what the word esoteric means. It comes from the Greek esoterikos, whose roots mean further in. The Greek word was originally used to denote the works in philosophical schools that were not given out to the general public, but were reserved for students. By the way, all, practically all the works of Aristotle are esoteric in this sense. Aristotle is considered to be a rather boring writer, and that's because none of his actual writings survived. What survived were lecture notes that were edited by his students. Apparently he was a beautiful stylist, but there's no evidence of this. There may be one uh, book of his, The Constitution of Athens, which was published in whatever that term meant in antiquity. So it's not, these are not necessarily esoteric in the sense we might understand that term. Um, but to some degree, esoteric teachings are more advanced for those who are further into the teachings than the general run of people. But in terms of what we're approaching this weekend, it also means that you have to go further in yourself to understand what they're about. What is curious about early Christian history is that there are constant references to secret teachings and hidden wisdom that are not given out to the general public, even sometimes among believers. If you were to ask most theologians today about this matter, they'll probably tell you that these secret teachings are the truths of salvation as the churches today understand them. This is clearly not the case. Writing in the early third century AD, the church father Origen specifically refutes this claim, saying, who is, this is a quote, 
Who is ignorant of the statement that Jesus was born of a virgin and that he was crucified and that his resurrection is an article of faith among many? In these circumstances, to speak of the Christian doctrine as a secret system is altogether absurd. But that there should be secret, certain doctrines which are revealed after the exoteric ones have been taught is not a peculiarity of Christianity alone. He was referring probably to the mystery religions of antiquity, which, perhaps like Christianity, had myths that were told in the form of funny stories, these weird stories about gods running around and abducting each other and doing whatever they did. Um, and once you got these myths and you wanted to know what you were, they were really about, they would take you in and you'd be initiated. So you would have to go further in to understand what those myths were about. And something similar seems to have gone on with Christianity. So the idea that, for example, Jesus was crucified and rose from the dead is not and never was part of esoteric teaching. As an aside, the first iconographic reference to Christianity, the first piece of art that has any reference at all to Christianity uh, is, I believe, a graffito, singular of graffiti, from the second century AD. It has a picture of an ass crucified. An ass is a donkey in a donkey. And it has, I don't know, Strombolius is God written underneath, kind of a way of mocking. So this guy wrote this graffito mocking um, the God of somebody he knew, this crucified ass, um, uh, presumably referring to Jesus. So this idea, if this was known to, say, a Roman juvenile delinquent of you know, the second century AD, this could not really be part of the secret teaching. Um, so then we're sort of led to, to ask, what are some of the key features of esoteric Christianity? In the first place, I would like to suggest that esoteric Christianity is not about Jesus the man, at least not nearly to the same degree that Christ conventional Christianity is. It may, and many esoteric, most, perhaps all esoteric Christians, have ideas and theories about who Jesus was, but these in general take second place to the idea that the life and teachings of Jesus are symbols of the path that each of us must tread. The God-man is born in humble and even rather humiliating circumstances. He is greeted with great hope. He comes of age and plays his part on the stage of time, making friends and also making enemies. Finally, he is crucified and dies on the cross known as time and space. But in the end, it does not matter. What is true and essential about him does not die, but rises again to live in a new and higher form. This is Jesus' story. It is ours as well. If it makes some people nervous to reduce the distance between Jesus and the ordinary individual to this degree, let me remind you that Jesus himself said, he that believeth on me, the works that I do shall he do also, and greater works than these shall he do. And quoting Psalm 82, six, verse 6, ye are gods. So here is one central theme of esoteric Christianity. We are gods, and the possibilities that Jesus made manifest are available to us. The difference between Jesus and us is perhaps one of degree rather than one of kind. Moreover, as I've already pointed out, the path of Christ is the one that each of us has to tread. Thus, the role of the passion of Christ is a little bit different, generally speaking, from that of mainstream Christianity, which portrays the role of Christ as to die for our sins. I don't know. I mean, personally, Taken at face value, this seems ridiculous to me. By this theory, God got mad at the human race 6,000 years ago because someone ate a piece of fruit in Armenia. He got so mad, in fact, that he resolved to damn all of humanity to eternal torment until he was able to send a part of himself down to earth to have it tortured to death as a way of making it up to another part of himself. Somehow this made it all right. Now, this sounds ludicrous, I know, but it is nothing more than the doctrine of the vicarious atonement 
that has been embraced by Christianity at least since medieval times. It was first formulated in a recognizable modern form by Anselm of Canterbury, um, but it was present in embryonic form long before that. To me, this view makes no sense. To those who wish to appeal to divine mysteries, I would reply that there are divine mysteries and paradoxes, but there are also logical absurdities, and it is no sign of wisdom to confound the two. Around 700 BC, the prophet Isaiah wrote, to what purpose is the multitude of your sacrifices unto me, saith the Lord? I am full of the burnt offerings of rams and the fat of fed beasts, and I delight not in the blood of bullocks or of lambs or of he goats. One could ask whether God might take any more delight in the blood of his only begotten son. For esoteric Christians, on the other hand, who often see the path of Christ as more emblematic than, strictly speaking, redemptional, the divine mystery remains. The mystery of the incarnation, which is not just the mystery of Jesus' incarnation, but of the incarnation of each of us, in a way grows deeper and more inclusive. The primordial shall we say, sin, of which each of us is guilty, is of having descended to a realm in which each of us, in our own way, eats of the tree of knowledge of good and evil. Redemption, then, is less a matter of being reconciled with a furious deity and more of remembering who we are and where we came from, as one of the formulas of the ancient Gnostics put it. Esoteric Christianity thus differs from the mainstream religion in being com considerably more open-ended in its claims about who Jesus was. Certainly there are some esoteric Christians who could re recite the Apostles' Creed or the Nicene Creed with full sincerity, but I would suspect that there are at least as many who might be reluctant to make elaborate pronouncements about the inner nature of a man who lived 2,000 years ago. Some might even go so far as to see Jesus as a purely symbolic, non-historical figure, and there are books and authors who've claimed this, uh, almost uh, as if he were another of the gods of um, the mysteries of antiquity. Although I would imagine uh, comparatively few would want to go this far, and I, I certainly wouldn't myself. Nevertheless, this whole subject raises the issue of historicity. An esoteric viewpoint has the enormous advantage for people today that it does not require belief in facts about a past that may not be so historical after all. Over the last 200 years, the authority of the Bible as a historical text has been consistently eroded. First of all was, of course, Genesis, which was challenged when geological and biological discoveries revealed that the Earth had been created millions, indeed billions of years before 4004 BC. By the way, do you know why the children of Israel could not have escaped from the hands of Pharaoh into the promised land of Canaan, in a literal sense? No, it was an Egyptian province at that time. It would be like saying, I got out of the United States and went to Alaska. No doubt there's some kernel of truth in it, but as something that was taken as history, it, it, these things have been constantly sliced back. In recent decades, the colloquium of liberal scholars known as the Jesus Seminar has drawn fire for its radical pairing of the historical material of the Gospels down to a very slender skeleton. But this was nothing more than was done by the German Protestant scholars in the 19th century. And if you want a summary of what they did and how they did it and how this process came about, I'd suggest that you read Albert Schweitzer's Quest of the Historical Jesus which was published in 1906. If you were skeptical even of skepticism, and this is by no means a foolish stance, you may at least want to consider the fact that we have not one eyewitness account of Jesus. There is nothing written by anyone who says, I was there and I saw him do this. Paul, in 1 Corinthians 15, does describe his own vision of the risen Jesus, which he identifies with what the apostles saw, but this is the only first-hand description of Jesus had. It's a, 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 I, curiously, it's the description of a mystical experience. Um, moreover, not one book in the New Testament was written by any of the 12 apostles, or as far as we can tell by anyone who knew Jesus directly. 
unless you think this is just some nutty theory on my part, this is exactly what you would learn in a New Testament course in any reputable non-fundamentalist divinity school today. These are truths that most clergy learn when they attend seminary, but they are not truths that usually get passed down to people in the pews. A few years ago, Dan Brown's Da Vinci Code captured the attention of the reading public, and I think we can be fairly well assured that it was due neither to its literary merit nor to its historical accuracy. Rather, the Da Vinci Code hit a nerve. Many people sense, however dimly, that they are not being given the whole story about Christian history. Though, of course, for that very reason, they're not quite clear about what that story might be. Thus, the doors open for all sorts of wild extravagances about Templars and Masons and Essenes and Gnostics and sacred bloodlines and so on. On the other hand, an esoteric perspective, which is somewhat more open-ended about all these historical claims, may make it possible to see the eternal truths that underlie Christianity without forcing us to adopt rigid, rigid and unsustainable factual stances. It also frees us up from having to make statements of faith about things that happened in the remote past that may never have happened at all, and almost certainly not in the way that they were imagined. Well, where can we take this? What kind of impact does or should an esoteric perspective have on our various faith communities? I want to say, speaking purely from a personal point of view, that this question does not interest me in the slightest. I myself don't belong to a faith community, and I have no interest in joining one. In a sense, faith to me seems to be the heart of the problem. Whatever this vexed and ambiguous term meant to say the author of the epistle to the Hebrews, today it is often best summed up by the anecdote about the kid who says, faith is believe in what you know ain't so. Again, speaking purely personally, I have no interest in faith in this sense or in communities built around such faith. What I am interested in is communities of knowledge. That is, communities of people who, rather than being united by their common belief in a string of often rather improbable propositions, are united by the search for knowledge and who are sincere and unflinching in that search. Such knowledge, of course, is not merely of a factual kind, but also the truths about who we are and where we came from. For this reason, I think it's particularly appropriate that this conference should take place under the auspices of the Theosophical Society, which for over 125 years now has been committed to promoting the search for this knowledge in an open-minded and non-dogmatic way. While the TS is not entirely free from dogmatism, no such organization is, it has been astonishingly effective in seeking out and finding new avenues of knowledge and new means of expressing them. It has also been remarkably effective in taking the ancient secret knowledge that is embodied in Christianity as well as in other traditions and making it known to a wider public. To take some fairly obvious examples, and the Theosophical Society was really the, the launch of these impulses. Um, Today, words like karma are part of the vocabulary of mass culture. While about 25% of the US population today believes in reincarnation, that figure has been fairly consistent over the last 15 years of polls. Did you realize that? That means that there are at least as many Americans who believe in reincarnation as there are Catholics. There are almost four times as many Americans who believe in reincarnation uh, than there are Southern Baptists who make up about 7% of the US population. And yet Catholics and Southern Baptists are regarded as part of the mainstream and are deferred to, sometimes perhaps rather excessively as a result of that, whereas New Agers who believe in things like reincarnation are frequently derided and sidelined. Nevertheless, as esotericists know, in this line it's not about numbers, nor is it even about allegiance. A late friend of mine ran a small esoteric school in England. Once he was telling me that he'd put together a flag for the school uh, for the purposes of some exercise out of some bits of cloth. And I said to him half jokingly, who knows, maybe someday there'll be people who will die for that flag. And he looked at me very pregnantly and said, when a spiritual impulse loses its strength, allegiance to it increases. 
This is a very sober and very illuminating point, I think, in the light of today's fundamentalisms and, and fanaticisms of all stripes. Esoteric organizations like the Theosophical Society have always had memberships that were in relation to the population as a whole infinitesimal. And the willingness to consider things fairly and open-mindedly may well seem lukewarm to those whose allegiance is vehement. But the true key is not quantity, but quality. More specifically, the capacity to launch a subtle impulse that may have an effect far greater than its own weight or mass might have indicated. To use the language of the Gospels, the kingdom of heaven is like leaven, which a woman took and hid in three measures of meal till the whole was leavened. Which brings me to the true purpose of this conference as I conceive it. It is not to spread a particular doctrine or a particular version of Christianity, but rather to reconnect ourselves with the eternal truths that are expressed in Christianity, but which have always been known. As St. Augustine put it, that which is known as the Christian religion existed among the ancients and never did not exist from the beginning of the human race until the time when Christ came in the flesh, at which time the true religion, which already existed, began to be called Christianity. Whether this true religion as it were, will continue to express itself in Christian terms, I for one don't know. But I'm confident that the speakers that we've assembled and the participants will shed some important and extremely valuable light on this question over this weekend. And I look forward to sharing it with you. Thank you. Can you repeat that quote from your friends? Uh, that, that sounded really good, but I didn't like over that again. Sure. When a spiritual impulse loses its strength, allegiance to it increases. I mean, that's not necessarily an exact quote. It happens to be the way I remember it. But you can see that there is something that the more, there's, you could say there's almost a Gresham's law of religion. Gresham's law in its classic form is good, bad money drives out good. One could argue that bad religion drives out good. The more a religion becomes the property of its more fanatical adherents, the more sensible and reasonable people are going to start looking for the exit. That's at least one possible implication of what he said. Um, obviously, it left quite an impression on me. This is more of a comment than a question. Mm -hmm. But it seems to me that Jesus himself was, a, was an esotericist, in that he tells his disciples uh, I will tell you the truth, but for those outside, I only speak in parables. Mm -hmm. And um, the implication to me is that Mark, Mark's gospel is itself a parable, which conceals as, mu as much as it reveals. Yeah, well, there are a number of dimensions to that comment. One is, I mean, there is this controversy about the secret gospel of Mark, supposedly discovered by a scholar named Morton Smith in a... Um, a monastery in Israel or Jordan. And a book was published a couple of years ago claiming that this was all his fabrication. I don't know the truth of that particular thing. I haven't read the, um, uh, shall we say, deconstruction of that thing. But sometimes people say that the reason that the Gospel of Mark, which is famously elliptical and famously brief and abrupt, is because it is so because there were other passages that were cut out. Did you know the Gospel of Mark is the oldest of the four Gospels by pretty much anyone's account? The Gospel of Mark uh, lost its ending. Its ending is gone. It ends with the women at the tomb being afraid to say anything about the empty tomb because they were afraid. That is how it ends. In Greek, the, the last word of the, of the text is a, is a conjunction. That's how abrupt uh, an ending it is. Now, in your Bibles, um, you know, you will see a couple of alternate endings. There's a short ending and a long ending. Um, but it goes without saying that neither of those is the original ending. Was that lost? Did somebody decide to rip out the last page because it just made them too nervous and said things that didn't, um, 
jive with what later Christianity taught? Was it a secret teaching? I mean, I don't know that we'll ever know. Um, it is a, it's just a funny anecdote about that. I once had the privilege of visiting a snake handler church in uh, Tennessee Holler. Regrettably, no uh, snakes were handled at the event, which I thought was kind of a disappointment. But, you know, I did mention to the guy, you know, that part of Mark isn't really, because that's, that's the part where Jesus says, you'll take up serpents and they won't bite. That's not even really part of the original ending. And he said something like, yeah, I know, but still. Um, but yeah, there, and that, that is kind of what, what is in, and were the texts, I mean, another quote from Origen is, even the Gospels are not historically true. Some things in there are true, some things uh, are introduced that never actually happened as a way of um, divulging or, or uh, discussing or symbolizing certain mysteries. Um, and what happened, I think, in the mainstream church is that that became increasingly lost. And as a result, they sort of had to say, well, it, we didn't lose it. We, you know, this is, always, this is all that it ever really was. And that is kind of generally what, what you'll get. Um, but you know, and there are also certainly many texts and many figures who you know, have very uh, esoteric and deeper interpretations of the Gospels. Do you see esoteric Christianity dying or? giving birth to a new renaissance? I don't know. I think what happens is that in any tradition, the, the truth, in a sense, because it's the truth, is never going to die. Um, it, it may die in certain forms. It may go underground and surface again even centuries later. Um, I myself see an enormous amount of interest in esoteric Christianity because the, the current choice is an extremely poor one. Um, the choice is, in the mainstream church, is either a literalistic approach to the Bible or the kind of liberal critical approach to the Bible, which would agree with all of the critical things, but it, it doesn't really leave anything left. Uh, you know, well, then, since none of this stuff really happened or... A lot of it probably didn't really happen the way it was written. Why should we believe in it anyway? And, you know, you see the liberal churches are shrinking as a result of that. The evangelical churches are growing because at least, you know, they're giving people something to believe in. Um, so, and I think a lot of you know, thoughtful, serious people are trying to look for some sort of um, other way of doing it. And the fact that these ideas, you know, had been in Christianity all along, this is not new. Um, again, it's never been a kind of a majority or, or large-scale thing, but it, it, it always has been something that's been present at times when Christianity needed some sort of revivification. Um, so that's the, the future. I don't know. I, I, there is definitely much more interest in the mystical side than there was even a couple of generations ago. Yeah. Hi. Um... Would you mind sharing your personal feelings or beliefs about what is being said in many communities regarding the new age and therefore the new energies that are streaming in? And I'd also like to know what your thoughts would be about that in relation to the Christ consciousness and maybe relating that to Christianity overall. Okay. Well, in a sense, there is a new age. and The new age is already here. Um, things have changed so dramatically that, you know, even the, the structures of a generation or two ago seem sadly outworn. Um, to the degree that this... I think that there are higher energies being filtered in. Um, I don't see them in, in the way that they're sometimes portrayed as, you know, having... I, I, don't, I don't see everything kind of being transformed by the Space Brothers into kind of another <laughs> dimension. Some people do. I, it doesn't seem innately plausible to me. The Christ consciousness um, can be explored from many angles. But here's the way I would 
uh, phrase it. You'll notice that, for example, in the Gospel of John, it's structured around a number of I am statements. I am the door, I am the vine, I am the way, so on. Esoterically, now exoterically, it's Jesus. It's this man who showed up uh, a few couple of thousand years ago who is the way. Esoterically, that in you which says I am is the way. It is, shall we say, the door. It is the vine that connects you to the I am that's identical in everyone. If you understand that principle, and it's to some extent a matter of experiential understanding as well as conceptual, suddenly a lot of what seems mysterious in Christianity seems less so, and even a lot of mystical texts from other traditions start to seem a lot clearer, which are otherwise baffling. So that's the way I would see it. Looking at the subtitle of this uh, conference, Moving Beyond Literalism, since another way that you mentioned historicity is, is a problem, maybe moving beyond historicity would be another way of looking at this, the idea of the focus on the historical Jesus versus the Christ. I like to tell folks that it's true even if it didn't happen. But it is, you know, it, becomes, it then becomes an inner, a matter of an inner truth. And... People find it hard, you have to be fairly sophisticated to see the truth in a myth when you no longer believe in it entirely literally. Um, and I, there, I was reading a book uh, lent to me by my good friend Chris Bamford, whom you will hear tomorrow, you know, in which the book claims that um, whenever an age declines uh, and people lose faith, they start to relativize it and start to see it just as a myth in terms of other myths. Um, it's, it's much easier to believe if it's this. <clears throat> and people become more vehement and more focused on it, the more challenged it is. Um, a lot of, you know, fundamentalism is a concern, and rightly so, but the fundamentalists themselves see themselves as beleaguered. Um, you know, you turn on your TV and, and, you know, you have, you know, this kind of, uh, you know, this sort of you know, things making fun of Jesus and religion. Um, you know, uh, I haven't seen the new Bill Maher movie, Re Religulous. But, uh, you know, there's a fair amount in, you know, culture at large that is perceived as anti-religious. And, and, you know, the fundamentalists, uh, you know, conservatives of all stripes, you know, feel the need to kind of circle the wagons. It's, you know, and of course, they're very circling the wagons, their very defensiveness freaks everybody else out, so, so everybody else gets even nastier. You know, the whole thing just gets more and more polarized. And uh, I was listening to a talk by a scholar of religions uh, that was held at the, the TS headquarters in Alcott a couple of weeks ago, and he basically said that this is the issue facing Christianity, this polarization having to do with the literal truth of the Bible. Now, one other thing, just to, just to you kind of belabor this point, is that the in a sense, this crux is, fundamentalism is a Protestant phenomenon. There are really not many Catholic, funda there, there are no Catholic fundamentalists. There aren't any Orthodox fundamentalists. Why is this? Well, because the Catholic and Orthodox churches always portrayed scripture as a source of truth, and the tradition and the teachings of the church as another source of it. So the Bible was not the whole story. When the Reformation came and people, for some very, very good reasons, decided that the authority of the, of the, the spiritual authority of the church itself could not be questioned, well, what could they do? Well, they had to go back to the Bible alone, sola scriptura. And Protestantism, you know, is focused on that. It's, it's much more focused on the truth of the Bible as an authority. And tradition, whatever tradition is, is much weaker. So then, you know, you start, you know, and, and as Harold Bloom, who is a, uh, you know, a literary critic and, and a cultural critic as well, said, you know, the, the limp leather Bible being waved, you know, from the podium by the evangelist itself has become kind of a religious icon. Yeah. 
What do you think about the Course in Miracles and its influence upon the future society? Well, I, I have the highest opinion of A Course in Miracles. Uh, I, arguably, I would say it's the greatest spiritual text of the 20th century. Um, I, so I, I hold it in very, very high esteem. Um, it's, um, it is the only Christian theology that is logical. Uh, in a way that, say, Buddhism is logical. Buddhism is a logical religion. If you grant its premises, everything works out almost like a mathematical equation. It's true of the Christianity of A Course in Miracles. John Mundy, uh, who's been familiar and worked with A Course for practically since it, 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 its inception, uh, can probably talk a little more about this. But I, I have the profoundest respect for it. Um, it's sometimes, it's, it's said to be a Gnostic text. Um, and, and the mainstream church is Gnostic is practically 100% of the time a bad word. Um, but no, I, I have a very, very high uh, uh, regard for it. I think, it's, um, I think it's, it's been a very profound text. Unfortunately, it hasn't been served very well by its popularizers because it's actually a, a, rig it's a rigorous and difficult thing. If you're, in a sense, you have the mental discipline to challenge every negative thought you have. Um, that's not, you know, that's not just uh, brain candy. But it's popularizers, you know, who've written the best-selling books about it, and who sometimes are even, I'm not going to get into naming names, because I don't want to do that, but you know, sometimes are even confused with the, in being the author of the course themselves, have made it kind of squashy and feel good. And um, as a result, it hasn't been very well presented, even, even in the sense of the people with whom it's been most popular. But I think it's a, did Jesus, I, 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 how many of you are familiar with A Course in Miracles? As a, so you don't need to hear the whole spiel about how it came about and all that, or do you? Okay. Well, there was a, a woman who was a, she was a psychologist named Helen Shuckman in 1965. Uh, she was working at Columbia Presbyterian Hospital on the faculty, and she started hearing this voice saying, this is a course in miracles, please take notes. And, you know, she's, since she was a psychologist, you know, I'm hearing voices in my head, I think I'm going crazy. So she had a colleague that she was very close to, a guy named Bill Fetford, and she, she sort of said, you know, I'm hearing these voices, you know. And he said, well, you know, you're not really crazy in the sense that you know, you haven't really lost your grip of reality the way a real, you know, paranoid schizophrenic might. And she said, well, what shall I do? Well, why don't you just write down what it says to write down? And so she ended up writing what came to be a 1,200-page work consisting of a, a, a text, which is kind of a theoretical thing, a workbook of 365 lessons, and a short teacher's manual. If you are interested in working with a course, I personally would suggest starting with the workbook. Uh, it is the most accessible thing to do. Uh, it's not easy in the sense that it requires the discipline to do it, but it's, it's a bit more accessible than the text itself. But it's a, it sold, I don't know, probably a couple of million copies in the last, uh, since it was published in 1975. Um, there are churches devoted to it. Um, there are even, you know, people who interpret Course in Miracles slightly differently and get into quarrels about it, just, just like anything else. So. Um, but it's, I, I just have a very high regard for it. What brought me here the word esoterics. And to me, it means beautiful. The beauty of it was what brought me here. Uh, uh, the esoterics of the Christianity, which in, I think I am a Christian. And... Uh, so what we have here is all beautiful, and I'm enjoying it to the hilt. So therefore, I'm trying to say, and you say, we are all gods, which in, I think I am. And uh, Jesus, when I see all of you here, that I brought, came here, and is to see Jesus in all of you, and I'm enjoying it to the hilt. Thank you very much. Going back to A Course in Miracles, 
Um, you mentioned that it was, you said, arguably one of the finest spiritual texts of the 20th century. What others would you put on the short list? Well, I mean, you know, the, it's, uh, my tastes are fairly idiosyncratic. Um, I've always I've been a big fan of Gurdjieff's, uh, G.I. Gurdjieff, uh, and his bizarre masterpiece, Beelzebub's Tales to His Grandson. Um, which is itself kind of an allegory about the human condition, I, I, I think is very uh, good. It's, it's a weird book. I mean, it's kind of like the Finnegan's Wake of esotericism. Um, and it's not quite as difficult to read as Finnegan's Wake, but it has its difficulties. Um, one that I particularly like is a, a work called Gnosis by Boris Moraviev. Boris Moraviev was not exactly a friend of Gurdjieff's. He knew Gurdjieff and didn't like him. Uh, but he wrote a three-volume, well, the subtitle is Study and Commentaries on the Esoteric uh, Tradition of Eastern Orthodoxy. And I think it casts an enormous amount of light on this subject, and I think he, he was a, a Russian emigre. Uh, he published those books in French in the early 60s, and they were translated into English in the 90s. Um, but they're, I think, quite remarkable books. Um, a lot of people, and I, I would agree, uh, think very highly of Meditations on the Tarot, which is uh, subtitled A Journey in Christian Hermeticism. And this was written, it was published anonymously, but it was discovered that it was written by, a, uh, well, he was originally a Baltic German uh, uh, emigre named Valentin Tomberg. And it is, it's very Catholic. Um, and he started out as an, I suppose he started out as a Lutheran, ended up for, for a long time was an anthroposophist, that is to say a, fo a follower of Rudolf Steiner, and ended up converting to Catholicism. But it's, it is a very profound exploration of the major arcana of the Tarot in Christian terms. And it, it had a preface written uh, for it by Hans Urs von Balthasar, who strangely enough, and these, and these things, strange things do happen, is one of Pope Benedict the Sixteenth's favorite theologians. So those are some of the works I would. There, there was a um, a list of the hundred greatest spiritual classics uh, of twentieth uh, century, which I know the guy who put it together. And of course, in miracles, was never going to appear on that one. Um, um, uh, but uh, other th what what other things were on there? The Gospel according to uh, the Gospel of Sri Ramakrishna. Um, well, anyway, but those are some. This is, this is not exactly a question, it's an observation, and I'd like you to comment on it. I've been thinking a lot about fundamentalism lately, and I'm just putting this out, and I'd just like you to comment about it. The, the value I see of fundamentalism is that as, it, if it's a first stage, like there are many people, I work in the prison population, and there are many people who gravitate to fundamentalism because they haven't had the structure of values that they can follow and they need somebody to follow, need rules, which is a good thing because it, it brings them from one stage to another. The, the problem, as I see, is that they, they get stuck there and they don't move on to another stage, which is a, a critical thinking stage and thinking for themselves. They need a parent and they stay stuck with that parent. I just I like your thoughts on that. Well, I agree uh, that fundamentalism, you know, it, I mean, not everybody is going to be interested in esotericism. This, this stuff is, is it's subtle and difficult and elusive. Um, and it's, it's often of, an, of such a nature that you may feel you have an insight and then it sort of evaporates in your hands and then where are you? Um, and if you need, and that's kind of the, the way it is. Um, if you need something, you know, I really need this to hang on to, I really just need to believe this simply and just do it, you know, it, it does have that value. Um, and for many people, it's, you know, it's, it's just, they're just, they're not going to go further. Um, you know, that it, so if, if on the positive side, if it teaches you to be, you know, a good person and to, um, you know, behave morally and decently, you know, I think, I think it has value. I mean, I think the thing that people become 
scared of is that the, the, is, it, is it has often such a paranoid element. Like I lived in Tennessee for a, a couple of years, uh, around 89, 90, and I knew a woman who, I mean, the new age circle in Knoxville, Tennessee was not very large. Everybody knew each other very rapidly, even, even someone like me who just moved there. Um, and I knew some, one woman who, you know, she lived in a small town and, you know, her ex-husband sort of was sort of portraying her as a witch. Um, you know, and she's ostracized. And, you know, it, it gets to the point of that kind of mentality where it actually hurts people, whether it, it starts to do real damage. Um, there, I think, you know, one has to draw the line. That it, you know, if, if someone has to have a, some kind of belief that, you know, they hold on to and that means something to them and helps them hold their lives together, I think that's fine. I think what, what people object to in it is that, that, that other, that kind of paranoid element. You know, I mean, and that is not strictly entirely just limited to fundamentalism. I mean, there's, uh, I believe it was a, a historian named Richard Hofstetter who wrote a book called The Paranoid Style in American Politics. You know, it's sometimes fun, takes the form of fundamentalism, sometimes immigrant bashing, you know, you could trace it all the way back. It has a long and regrettably rich history in American uh, social life. Um. I, I'm an Episcopal priest. I went to a three-year uh, seminary, and so I, you know, I know about you know the doctrine of the Holy Trinity and the Church calendar, both the old one and and the new one, and uh, you know, um, the I know what uh, transubstantiation and consubstantiation and various you know theories of the Eucharist are and so forth. And my son just started, or a couple of years started at a Waldorf school, and I've met several anthroposophists. And I, I mean, I, I don't really know what I'm asking, except maybe because I don't know enough about anthroposophy to really ask this question. But it seems to me that that they're using these same words uh, or same terms, and they're using them in a way that's very meaningful to them, and I think would be to me if I knew what they meant. But um, but it's different. And I don't get the sense that they know what the difference is. And I don't know whether that's important. But um, mm -hmm. I don't know if you if you if you know what I mean. Uh, yeah. I, yeah, I mean, I can I can say a little bit about it. I mean, anthroposophists are followers of the teachings of Rudolf Steiner, who was a Austrian esotericist who died in 1925. Um, and he's lectured voluminously. There are like 300 volumes of his lectures in German. I think only slightly, a little bit more than half, what, two thirds? So it's less than half are uh, translated. Um, he viewed himself to some degree as a Rosicrucian, that is to say, an esoteric Christian. Um, and he, he also, taught what he believed spiritual, was called spiritual science. That is to say, he wanted, or the idea was that people would develop certain abilities so that they would be able to see in the unseen realms and do their own researches. The anthropologists mostly just ended up just reading Steiner's books and they never, this never really kind of materialized, but that was at least the original idea. He was very influential in a, a fields you do not normally think of as esotericists um, having a great deal of influence in. Uh, for example, the biodynamic farming movement, which is extremely popular. I mean, Rudolf Steiner did not think drinking was good. He thought that uh, wine had been introduced to dull the uh, higher capacities of humankind and didn't really encourage his followers to drink wine. Nonetheless, in Burgundy, the best vineyards uh, today are practically all biodynamic. One of the ironies of whatever. Um, the Waldorf education, he, he, it's so called because he put a school together for uh, the owner of a company called the Waldorf Cigarette Factory in Germany who wanted to have a, a school for his workers, children. And again, it's, it's based on kind of an esoteric uh, view of the child. Um, nonetheless, on, on the mystery of Golgotha, I, I believe, and, and the theology is a, is a complex one, but I believe that the idea was that at the time of the coming of Christ, humanity had become too densely 
stuck in the, the world of matter. And that Christ's spilling his blood, literally spilling the blood of Christ on the earth, kind of sacralized the earth and sort of loosened some of these forces that had gotten kind of stuck. And so that, you know, I mean, he, he, Steiner is, you know, definitely an esoteric Christian. Uh, it's not the only type of esoteric Christian, but he was one. The, there's a denomination, a rather small denomination, called the Christian Community that, um, you know, is, 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 it kind of works with the understanding of his teachings. <laughs>